Hello and welcome to the Scenic UK podcast. This week we're not talking about phones and shiny gadgets as usual, but instead we have got a great interview with a particular film man. It's not Rich, but Rich, you are going to tell us all about this interview, aren't you? Yes, that's right. I did an interview with a film man, and that film man was screenwriter Zach Penn. Uh, So he has made a career out of uh, writing movies based on comic books, such as The X-Men and The Avengers. I've Um, heard of those. uh, You've heard of those? Good, good. They're pretty big, I hear. Yeah. So um, uh, that's made him the kind of go-to guy for big-budget, effects-driven blockbusters, like he also worked on Pacific Rim Uprising and Ready Player One. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit bit, uh, about today. Cool. Um, I've, I do know of Ready Player One. I actually haven't seen it, um, but I believe oh, well, it's, like, it's really like case. geek culture and gaming culture thing. Is yeah, that right? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, directed by Steven Spielberg, it's based on a novel by Ernest Klein, and the idea of the novel it's is based on a book. It's based on a book, and it's about um, it's about this book. this sort of future dystopia where. Uh, uh, people in this kind of like nightmarish world, they uh, they live out their fantasies in this virtual reality world called the Oasis, where they can be anyone they want to be, including their favourite uh, comic book, TV, movie characters. They can drive the car from Ghostbusters or the car from Back to the Future. They can they can have, wear the skin of uh, of, uh, of of video game characters or of Batman or Harley Quinn or whoever, whoever they want to be. Uh, and that's wear that's a skin. virtual that's a you, virtual skin. Okay, that's I was av- going to say avatars. you've made it seem like you've just gone and skinned Batman and <laughs> just put it on the skin of Batman. That's weird. I wonder if the cape is attached. Um, um, but yeah, so uh, so I had a chat to Zach Penn, who uh, who wrote the movie, adapted the movie, yep. and uh, we talked a little bit about uh, whether we're going to get bored of superheroes anytime soon with all the superhero movies we've got. We talked a little bit about whether toxic fandom is poisoning the uh, the blockbuster franchises that we all love so much, and uh, and what his plans are for rebooting the Matrix of all <gasps> things. Uh, sacrilege. But uh, first, I asked him to take us behind the scenes and talk about how a big budget blockbuster like Ready Player One gets made. Yeah, so uh, uh, Ready Player One. Um, it must have been incredible to to work on a movie that's kind of like so unlimited in scope. It's like everything in the kitchen sink is in there. That must have been uh, yeah, that must have been a lot of fun to do, right? Uh, it was a tremendous amount of fun. I mean, it's it's uh, sometimes daunting when you can do anything. Mm. Um, you kind of narrowing it down. But in this case, we, you know, we had enough guidance and there was enough uh, specificity so that it was kind of like okay, we have to generally stick to this, but we can use all sorts of different things. And it was particularly fun just, you know, because you don't want the movie to be about the references, Hmm. but it is fun to kind of populate an action scene with all sorts of weapons and characters from other uh, movies and TV shows and comic books just as background noise. It's just, it's kind of a fun thing to do, Hmm. so... It seemed like there were a lot of voices involved. There's Ernest Klein, there's Spielberg, there's kind of the VFX things. Was that all? Were those conversations all kind of happening concurrently with you writing the script? Like, what was the actual kind of the process for you in terms yeah, of getting no, it down on the page? Me, Adam, and a group of the physical production people, as well as people from ILM and Digital Domain, were all at the Amblin offices in uh, in the Valley in Los Angeles. So we were all working together literally on the same hall for quite a long time for, you know, close to a year, I think. So, and we had a giant, you know, board in our hallway that showed us everything that cleared as it cleared. So we kind of knew, okay, well, we need a robot. Who are we going to use? And we walk out in the hall and take a look at it. So, but yeah, it was great. That was the best part of it. I mean, normally you don't, the writer doesn't get, to collaborate, uh, you know, and vice versa that, you know, the effects people and the production designer don't normally have the writer sitting there at their beck and call. So for all of us, it was kind of an ideal way to work. And that's really due to Steven. He kind of fosters that. He's like, no, 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 you be in every meeting, go to everything. Mm-hmm. Anything we can get you to go to, you got to go to. In terms of the actual, like, your, your process, are you sort of collecting this information and you sort of go away and write a full draft? Or are you sort of hopping around doing scenes here and there? Or how does, how does that, the actual kind of getting... Well, you know, it starts with a full draft that, you know, you, first there's a draft that went to Stephen to get him on board the movie. And then after he signed on, he and I sat down and for about six months, you know, we would be looking at sporadic stuff coming in from people, but also just rejiggering the story and, you know, get, getting notes back and forth, etc. cetera. It, it sounds like a sort of almost a logistical challenge as well as a creative one. If, some, if, if, if new stuff is coming in, 
do you then have to kind of keep track of uh, like how does this sort of you know send ripple to the rest of the story? Do I have to go back and change other things or that kind of thing? Well, the truth is, on most movies, it is a huge logistical mess because nobody's really talking to each other. So you get a sequence back that has all these changes in it, and you then have to, you know what I mean? There's a lot of back and forth where it's like, oh, I worked on this for two weeks, and then you worked on it for two weeks. Because you're all in the same room, Mm. you know, the logistical challenges are completely inside the story, you know, inside the movie, and very little outside, you know, we would all agree in the room, Mm. this is what we're doing. And then go off to, you know, the next morning we'd see everyone again. The, the traditional idea of, of kind of a, of a writer is someone sort of hunched over a typewriter uh, on their own. But this sounds like a very collaborative thing. Is that the way that modern blockbusters are made now? And, and, and has that changed in those sort of the, the years you've been working as a writer? Most of them do run this way. And I think that's a good thing because you're dealing with creative, you're dealing with artists, you know, and practicalities. You're dealing with, you know, they'll tell you this is something we can't do well. So it's so much better when you change the sequence. You know, it used to be they couldn't do hair well, you know, mm. like that was the hair and water were a big problem. Mm. And so you could be stubborn and just not care, or you could try to write to that and not have your characters be really hairy. Um, is that why so, Xavier is, uh, is bald then? Is that, is that, is that why that is? <laughs> yeah. No, no. Although there might be some old, you know, that's the funny thing is a lot of the things that influence comic books in terms of like why all their costumes or the colors they were, it has to do with drawing and printing, you know, and some yeah. of it does. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if Xavier, it was good to have him bald because it was easier to draw. Yeah. But yeah. They were just doing, I don't want to speak for anyone. <laughs> I don't want to speak for Jack Kirby or whoever drew, yeah. drew the first X-Men. Talking about, about comic book movies and superheroes. Um, when you've got a movie like ready player one, which just has, has like all the heroes in it and they're all side by side from across all different kind of franchises and properties and stuff. Is that like the, the end point of, of comic book adaptations? Like is what, what do comic book adaptations need to do to keep, to keep going the way they are now? I remember we would get some people asking, how are you going to do all these cameos? And I kept saying, they're not cameos, you know, they're just background stuff. So so it actually was nowhere near as difficult as some of the X-Men movies or some of the Marvel movies in terms of the number of characters. But, but I think your question is valid for other reasons, right. which is what do you do when there's 40 Marvel characters and they're all played by actors and they're all, you know, it's, you know I know the guys who wrote them. And it's hard to give everyone screen time. Yeah. In Ready Player One, it's pretty easy, you know, because they just have to run past camera. <laughs> right, yeah. So... And they don't have to be true to themselves. So they're not true to them. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, it's like Comic-Con, the movie, you know, with, with a bunch of people dressed up like, you know, Batman and Superman. They don't all have to fly. None of them should fly, you know, because people yeah. can't fly. So. Sure. Do you think there's, I mean, there's been people, people like uh, Terry Gilliam and stuff have talked about, uh, was it Terry Gilliam or James Cameron? No, James Cameron um, said about, you know, people might be getting superhero fatigue. Uh, is that something that you think is going to happen? Well, how, how is the genre kind of going to stay fresh? Well, I think, you know, it, it's a little bit of a of a generational thing. Like when they say, I do think people might get sick of superheroes. Mm. What I don't think they're going to get sick of is comic book adaptations. Mm. That what people forget is a lot of comic books. I mean, the Hulk is not a superhero. You don't, you don't structure his story like a superhero story, you know. The X-Men aren't superheroes. I mean, it's much more like a straight science fiction movie about a persecuted group of unusual people you know they don't like literally go out and fight crime the you know the characters that are like that you know spider-man captain america etc and a lot of the dc characters i mean there's a lot of them obviously those stories are getting harder to tell like where someone gets some powers you tell their origin they go out and fight crime of some sort and do the right thing yes it's going to get harder and harder to tell those because there's been too many. But, you know, Marvel, I mean, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy is not a superhero movie. It just happens to be based on a comic book, mm. you know? Okay. I mean, is Star Wars a superhero movie? I don't think anyone would define it that way, you sure. know? Um, but so that's one of the crucial things is, like, will people stop making movies based – will people get sick of movies that have the Marvel or DC – uh, you know, logo in front of them. I don't think so. I think people really underestimate 
how much material is in that, you know. I know that when I got to Hollywood and I would tell people, it's not just people in tights fighting crime, you know. This is, you know, there was this sense of like, what do you, you know, they're just cartoons. I was like, I think you're thinking of comic books that were different than the ones I grew up on, you know. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. I, you've got like think, Ant Man, Ant Man's, Ant Man's a comedy, and then you've got sci fi, Guns, Galaxy, and like there's all these different genres, right, within that one sort of Marvel thing. Right. I mean, what's Thor Ragnarok? That's definitely not a superhero movie. It's, okay. it's a crazy mythological, you know, uh, comedy of yeah. some sort. But, but look, do I, I also think there's some just general blockbuster fatigue among some people. I mean, not among young people because they don't even know about the first round. I, I have some. You know, I get a little tired of seeing, you know, of movies where I can predict where the ending is going, you know. But uh, not if they do something different. I, look, I think it just forces people, you have to do something different. You, right. you, you really can't just give them the same old, same old. And I, I think everybody, I know the people at Marvel and DC are acutely aware of that. So. Yeah. That's really interesting. I, I love that he was so involved in the process because my understanding of a lot of Hollywood movies is that the writer sort of, you know, reels off this 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 concept, this idea, mm. hands it to a producer, and then the writer just goes on holiday or and ha and then has no more parts in the thing. That's what I normally assume. Yeah, absolutely. You have this vision of a, of a sort of screenwriter kind of hunched over a typewriter and then they hand in it Starbucks. off. Starbucks. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but it, it seems like, especially these days with these kind of movies, I think one of the things he sort of touched on was the fact that um, the visual effects people are involved so early on, partly out of time. Like, they don't have a lot of time to make these movies. I know um, I, I did an interview with Stephen DeKnight who wrote and directed Pacific Rim Uprising uh, and Zach, which Zach Penn also did some work yeah. on. Uh, and he talked about how he had very, very little time to do it. And uh, so the visual effects people brought in very early, partly to do pre-visualization, which is kind of like a digital storyboard yeah. where they kind of plan out the story, but partly to give ideas and partly just to so they can get started on doing the work. It so it's a sense. much more collaborative process. Yeah, exactly. And it makes sense to have that collaboration because you, what's the point in having the writer come up with something that can't really be done? But like when everyone is a creative in their own section, like it, it makes sense to bring everyone together to to brainstorm these ideas. Although I suppose you run the risk of having this one writer's glorious vision, you know, being <laughs> destroyed by, uh, um, you know, too many, too, too many yeah, cooks. Too involved. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it, I mean, it, it, I think that's when you need like a strong hand on the cell. That's where your director or your producer comes in. So sure. you, if you've got someone like, uh, for example, Marvel has Kevin Feige, is, uh, is, who's kind of in, in the overlord of all, all the Marvel movies. And there's uh, John Favreau is obviously like a big uh, voice in Marvel movies. Ready Player One obviously had Steven Spielberg. And yeah. what Steven Spielberg says goes. So yeah, Steven you don't Spielberg argue with is, Spielberg. Exactly, either. yeah. So I think it's great that, uh, I mean, it's really cool actually that Steven Spielberg was in charge of Ready Player One. And he had this kind of collaborative atmosphere where the, everyone, the writer, the production designers, the VFX people were all putting ideas in, but there was still this kind of like defining vision. Um, so it's kind of it's, it's interesting, and I, I think it's interesting as well that um, that you know talking about Marvel as well, like how Marvel and DC are acutely aware of uh, of how they have to keep superheroes fresh because we've had so many superhero movies. Yeah, I mean this year alone, Avengers, Black Panther, Ant Man. That's just from Marvel, and then you're gonna have Aquaman later from from DC, and so and so then we um, start rebooting ones that they've already done. You know, so mm. we've had like multiple Spider-Mans Spider yeah. <laughs> and and I, I don't know I mean I, I don't see a lot of them I just see these constant flow of different mm. movies and then it seems like they're sort of plumbing the depths of oh let's find a some superhero that we haven't really touched on that much and let's give them a story and well, then let's give them a backstory and then let's give them a collaboration where one superhero meets another one and suddenly their universes collide. You've nailed it. You could you could be in charge of this. If you like this, you're going to love another project that Zach Penn is working on. It's called Rom Space Knight, which is a comic book character and toy that very few people have probably heard of outside of uh, uh, comic fans. But um, so, so yeah, so th there, there is a lot of them a lot of them coming up. But um, one of the interesting things about, uh, especially when looking at like, DC and Marvel is uh, is the you know the uh, this idea of like fans getting so so engaged and invested in it that it becomes almost like an online online war. So I think it's interesting that um, that Ready Player One. Uh, addresses that directly like it's, it's actually a story about fans of stuff yeah and you know you see the last jedi as well that was uh, a movie that was quite divisive among star wars fans because it's in a way it's a movie about being a fan of star wars yeah um with the character of kylo ren who is uh, obsessed with the past and with the legends of the past and the whole movie is about you know setting that aside and, and moving on and ready player one is is, is very similar and so it does have that kind of meta message which i think it really improves over the book actually so um the book is is very much about these these guys who 
who love all this stuff that they see you know in the oasis they're obsessed with monty python and with uh with you know the movie war games and uh, and it's um uh, and, and you know all the stuff that were kind of pop culture ephemera of their childhoods they're just obsessed with it but at a very kind of like a trivia level and uh, it's interesting that the movie kind of moves that on a little bit and talks a bit about uh, uh, kind of more than just reciting the, the words but actually kind of learning from them and in fact actually so it was one of the big scenes one of the big changes that's in the movie is uh, the uh, in the book there's a scene where the character has to like reenact the movie war games but in the, in the movie they change it to The Shining uh, and I'm not sure entirely how I feel about kind of recreating such a classic movie but they do do something interesting where it's not about reenacting the movie it's about learning from the movie and sort of moving on from what you've learned from that i don't want to spoil it too much if you haven't seen the movie but uh, uh yeah it's uh, it's an interesting adaptation so we I'm also they don't just sorry to interrupt you but mm. I, i'm presuming that they don't they don't just recreate the whole shining uh, like, the, there's, the, the characters from Ready Player One go into the, the, the Overlook Hotel in The Shining and it's kind of like lovingly recreated. But like I say, there is kind of an, an extra twist on it. How you feel about, you know, this 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 uh, this kind of desecration of a classic is, is entirely up to yeah. you. But uh, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting change they made over the book, certainly. And uh, But the, one thing is that, that uh, there was various candidates. It wasn't The Shining was one of the many candidates. And uh, uh, so I talked a little bit to Zach Penn about uh, what happened there. One of the one of the highlights is the the shining sequence. Um, I was wondering. I mean, yep. that, that's changed from from the book. I was wondering, uh, was it always going to be the shining, or were there other options, and what were the kind of considerations for what film that was going to be? No, no, there it was. There was many considerations, and in fact, briefly, it was going to be. I think I wrote a version of Blade Runner in, and there's a variety of reasons why we couldn't do it. Um, mm. One of which was they're making a new Blade Runner movie. Yeah. Um, which actually, in retrospect, is good because it would have been really weird to have it come out like right on the heels of the other Blade Runner movie. But mm -hmm. also because we got to do The Shining. I mean, Ernie and I, that was something we collaborated on. And, you know, he had, from the very beginning of when I started writing on it, I talked about trying to do a more, you know, more action-oriented, getting sucked into a movie like Last Action Hero, which he's a big fan of. Mm. Uh, you know, my first script, which yeah. he liked a lot more than I do. But um, but we all, I had always wanted to write it as something where you would, it wasn't like the movie Yoki that it was in the book, that it was more yeah. like a an adventure experience. And we wrote up a list of other options, you know, that were all relevant, you know, that would have been right, which would have been some movie from the 80s. We really thought Stephen would never go for The Shining. So when he did and said, oh, my God, I love it, we were so thrilled because it's kind of the perfect movie for this because it's so unusual. You know, it's not – it's such a weird movie in, in so many great ways that and, – and has so much power to it that it's not just – you know, just walking into it is a thrill, you yeah. know? In terms of the sort of the, uh, the, um, the, the, the advancing the character through that, that set piece, uh, what was it thematically that you were looking for that you were looking for in the movies that you, you know, you considered? Well, you know, one thing that we really wanted was something that could cut away at the notion or undercut the notion that it was all about knowing trivia. You know, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, I always felt that like Halliday wouldn't just want someone who could match his knowledge of trivia. That's not enough to prove. And in fact, he'd want one of the challenges to show that the person doing it could be flexible. You know, you don't want some trollish fanboy being, you know, a person who can only, who's never learned anything outside of the Oasis. That's what he's trying to get away from. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea is what's a movie which has some sort of extra power to the idea of violating the, the canon of the movie itself. And, you know, there's the lines where he's like, there's no zombies in The Shining. And she says, maybe that's the point. You know, Artemis is like, maybe that's the point. We're supposed to be, like, if we just stuck with it's got to be what's in The Shining, they would have been dead. But it's, they were, at that point, fluid enough to realize, okay, maybe that's what Halliday's trying to say. And it's perfect with The Shining because it's based, you know, the movie's nothing like the book, and Stephen King hated the movie. And, you know, it's kind of the perfect, uh, you know, analog for what we were trying to do. Right. So, like the argument about how faithful it is becomes literally what the the difference in life and death. You know, where if earlier in the movie there's sequences where it's how well you know trivia might help you get through a sequence. 
this is one where that's actually unhelpful. Mm. Um, a few reviewers noted this, you know, like I was excited when people actually caught that it was, that's something we worked very hard to put in there is if it weren't for his friends telling him, if it weren't for one friend not knowing the movie at all yeah. and another friend telling him to stop focusing on exactly what the details of the movie were, we wouldn't have gotten through this challenge. Right. right. So, so it's kind of meta message is, is quite interesting. I mean, I know you're a, you're a, you're a, you use Twitter. Um, do you think that, uh, that that kind of message of like uh, to, to sort of people who think of themselves as fans but in a very kind of slavishly devoted way, uh, you know, do you think that's an important thing for sort of fandom to take on? I, I do. I mean, you know, it's funny. Ernie said, here I am, the author of this book that's very different from the movie, writing a sequence with my character com complaining about how different the book is from the movie, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, I do think it's important because I think people, on the one hand, I think the number of people who are actually trolls are probably overestimated because I've been dealing with them for many, many years before the Twitter and before right. the internet was as popular. There's always like a very loud group of people. You know, I always joke like you wouldn't, these are people who wouldn't be satisfied unless we literally filmed the book and the page is turning, you know, right. that's what they want. Right. Um, it, well, that's what they think they want. And then they get furious that you, you know, desecrated the book. But um, I think it's important for people to realize the difference between someone not caring at all about the fans and just putting out product to get money from them, which I understand that provoking a negative reaction mm. and somebody trying to, you know, interpret the material where, you know, it doesn't burn up your comic book or your book or your, you know, the old TV show. They don't disappear when someone makes a new version of them, you know, mm. and yeah, it gets pretty toxic, but I also try to, but I, I, you know, I think it's a larger cultural point. It's just in general the idea of like you can you can love things. I mean, I'm quoting the movie, but you can love things. But if it doesn't bring you together with other people who love them, what value does it have? Mm. Whereas if it brings you together with people, then it inherently has value. You know, if you you make your friends, nobody would say, "What are you kids doing? A bunch of you playing chess together and then getting together to play chess on the weekends." This is terrible, you know, like yeah. you never say that to kids about chess. Well, there's nothing wrong with people becoming fans of something, you know, together and that bonding them. But if it just turns into something to like keep lists of like statistics in sports, yeah. then you've, I think you've missed the point. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, definitely. I think that's an important message to get out there. I mean, we, I think we're fairly overt. So finally then, Rich, he is, we have already touched on, working on something else. Isn't Rom he? the Space Knight, yes. And also, The Matrix. Yeah. Go, I, I had no <laughs> idea this was a thing. Because Matrix is one of the films I have seen. I've seen all three of them, although only one of them is worth talking about. Um, well, this, this is it. I mean, they, they vary so wildly in quality that the, the idea of rebooting The Matrix is, it feels like sacrilege. But then also the idea of having another crack at the sequels. I, I don't know. It's, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we uh, ask the man himself to explain his plans in his own words? Uh, speaking of, uh, of films that you're, that you're working on as well, uh, what's, uh, where are you up to with The Matrix? Can you say anything about that at all? Uh, in the middle of working on it. Okay. <laughs> Literally, I'm sitting here at my computer. After we talk, I'll get back to it. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of interesting things surrounding it, but they're all, everybody's waiting for me to hand in this draft. So, right. um, but, but it's no longer just a fantasy. You know, like at one point, I didn't have a draft that, you know, I hadn't even started writing, and now I'm right in the middle of it. So, okay. um, so I'm excited, though. Uh, well, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I know there's a lot of kind of a lot of people asking you like whether it's a reboot or not. But what I was what it was was kind of more interested in is like what are the elements of the first film that you think that you want to continue that still kind of that still hold up in the in in sort of you know years down the line with different effects and a different world that we live in. Like, what are the kind of elements that you want to uh, that that you want to continue? Well, I would say it's more what I don't think I can do is I, I think the Matrix still holds up. You know, I think when you watch the first movie again, it has the same power it did. And that to just try to, you, you can't ape it. You know, you can't try to one-up it or ape it because I don't know if that's doable. You know, I would say the same, like, 
you couldn't do well there's a lot of movies that are like that but that's a i guess a lot of them also you can mm. uh, the the key for me is i just think it's a great mythology and going back into the mythology that they already established that the wachowskis established there's all these great stories that are you know in in the canon if you will mm. that have never even been touched on they you know they created all this ancillary material, you know, the comic books and the, and the animatrix. And there's so much in there. And, you know, I just happen to have a take on one part of that world and how we would get through it, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to pitch you, you know, it, it, you'll have to read it or see it, you know, yeah. because if I told you how I, I mean, it's such a tough, you know, it, it, to say, oh, yeah, I'll just do better than The Matrix in terms of the effects and action is a pretty hard claim to make. So yeah, yeah I'll, okay. I'll, I'll wait till I've actually delivered. Sounds cool. So when are we going to see it? Well, it's going to be a little while before we can re-enter The Matrix, so to speak. Uh, Zach Penn, as you said, he's still working on writing it. So we'll, uh, we'll see that in coming years. Yeah, years. Perhaps. Years and years. Uh, but in the meantime, you can see uh, Ready Player One is coming to uh, Blu-ray, digital, online, all the rest of it uh, very soon. Cool. Well, thanks, Rich, for the interview. Thank, thank you, Zach, of course. Uh, Rich, why don't you tell us where people can find you online? Uh, Twitter.com at Rich Nightwell at Rich Nightwell. Mm -hmm. uh, I am at Battery HQ, and you can, of course, get in touch with the show uh, with CNET UK podcast at cbsi.com. Uh, you can tweet to at CNET, you can follow us on Instagram, all the other stuff. Uh, please do like, uh, subscribe, and comment on the show. The comment box is below, yeah, of course. If, you if know where nice. to find it. If it's nice. If it's nice, yeah. Don't just say, Andy, why are you wearing that shirt with a space cat on? I was wondering, actually. It's because it's a CNET summer party, so I was told to dress brightly. <laughs> and as you know, most of my clothes are black. This is my only one that's got some color, and it's got a, it's got a cat. It's got a cat. Glasses. I mean, that just answers the question there. See, that's pretty yeah, cool. Lovely. I like that. Uh, thank you, and we will see you in two weeks' time.